All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll, we'll do a soft start so anyone else who's uh, joining in can, uh, can get all the good stuff that we're gonna talk about today. So hello everyone and welcome. We're very glad you're joining us today for our next installment in the Critical Discourse and Design series. We're grateful for the support of the Toyota Endowed series at Art Center. Our mission for this series is to provide a forum to explore design and its social implications through the lens of people, pedagogy, and practice. Today, we will be discussing inclusive research operations with two amazing guests. We have Dr. Edelina Longoria, who is a researcher, storyteller, problem solver, creative, and encourager. She's currently a senior UX researcher for a large enterprise software company, where she helps uncover design problems, serves as the, as the voice of the user, and is helping put the human experience at the center of HR products and services for millions of users across the globe. In her spare time, Dr. Longoria mentors young professionals and women, teaches, travels, crafts, plays plant mom, sings mariachi music, spends time with her 12 nieces and nephews, and serves at her church in Austin, Texas. We also have J.D. Buckley, who is a pioneer in design and user research with more than 15 years of experience leading teams across the technology and startup landscape. She has led the introduction of user-centered research initiatives at organizations from Yahoo, Disney, and Idea Lab to Kaiser Permanente, ADP, and Service Titan. JD brings this experience to Art Center as a faculty member and key industry contact for the college. And in her spare time, JD is an avid long distance runner and traveler. Anything else you'd like to add to the intro, JD and and uh, and Adelina? I think you did a good job. You did okay. a good job. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, great. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So I'm just going to go ahead and prompt you with, you know, inclusion has been this topic that's really a, become a bit, maybe a bit of a buzzword in the last couple of years. And so, just so everybody's on the same page, maybe you could, you know, define inclusive research and maybe share a bit about how you think of of inclusion within design and research. Uh, Adelina or, yeah, JD, feel free <laughs> to start. Go for it, Adelina. All right. So, I mean, I, from my perspective, you know, I, I work in enterprise, um, uh, enterprise research. So anything, you know, that for those who are listening, in case you're not really sure what enterprise research enterprise is, it's basically the, the software that you might use at your job, for instance, um, the, the business to business sorts of software out there, um, from your uh, learning platform to where you do your performance management, your goals. And, um, you know, for me, inclusive research is really being able to uh, hear uh, the perspectives of of a variety of different types of people, um, not just white collar workers, but blue collar workers, um, to hear uh, a, a di diverse voices, you know, black, brown, white, um, and, um, and, and people of, you know, different walks of life, different experiences, people that um, uh, might have a disability, um, or um, just be able to, um, you know, I just think of what we do and um, it's, you know, what we do is we're trying to design things to, to basically make sure that everybody does the best work that they can, right? Everybody has their giftings and, 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 and their skills and their abilities, but how do we um, enable them to do the best work that they can when they show up to work? And that's, you know, that's what I think about. Um, I think about inclusive research for the purpose of like enterprise. Yeah, Elena, I totally agree. I think, and, uh, you know, I work at an enterprise organization as well. When I think of inclusive research, I think of bringing more diverse voices to the table. Oftentimes companies um, get really focused on our target audience, um, but kind of broadening the scope of who we think our audience is and inviting more people in opening, kind of, I see it as opening up your arms a little bit to embrace some members of the audience who you may not assume are your target audience, but potentially it's because you haven't considered them. Um, people, uh, I think uh, we were, I was at work and we were having a conference yesterday and, and representation matters. So if you are a business to business software and there is no one in the organization that looks like you has the chooser or the buyer of that software, you might think it's not built for you. 
you might think you're not being considered. So when you think of inclusion, it's how can we invite more people in to the opportunity to improve their lives with, with software? Um, so for me, that inclusion is inviting more people into the room and giving them a seat at the table to be sure that the solutions are actually solving the broadest um, diverse array of people and considerations. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, yeah, I love that notion of you know bringing um, all these different voices to the table. I think there's always an opportunity, right? We go through seasons. I know we go through seasons if um, uh, on different teams. If you're on a UX team or on a research team, or just at a company, and you go through seasons where you know vision and goals change for the organization, and um, and how do we maintain that, right? I, I always think about that. How do we maintain our eyes? Or if we haven't looked at that perspective of bringing people into the table, how do we shift to that? You know, how do we shift to saying like, hey, our, our, our research operations, they need to, um, we, we need to talk to all these different people. And maybe that right now we haven't considered those, but how do we expand? How do we, how do we open our arms um, so that, you know, I think about the work that we do. It's not just, um, you know, it's just, it's not just about like, hey, can that person, you know, clock their hours, for instance, because that's part of, you know, some of our software, but it's like, how do we, how do, how do we open a door for people who uh, maybe start, you know, in blue collar jobs who have aspirations to be managers one day, or who have aspirations to um, do a different kind of job? How, how can we facilitate that for them? I mean, I, I don't think we think about that all the time, um, but I think there's room, there's room for us to not just serve uh, the voice of the current user, but to think about how do we advocate? How do we advocate for, for, um, for people who, who have a different, maybe different vision for their life? Yeah, or a different perspective. I think I like what you're saying. I love what you're saying is um, how do we advocate for um, a broader perspective, a broader scope of people to, to be able, I mean, the great thing about our profession, at least for me, one of the things I'm reasons I'm passionate about it is this opportunity we have to um, potentially improve the lives of everyday people by allowing by lowering the barriers of using technology, like everyday people who potentially years ago when software was really expensive could not consider or even imagine themselves using technology. But now it's become inexpensive enough where we see this proliferation of solutioning in terms of technology for farm workers, for essential workers. There's these opportunities. And if we can be sure that we consider a broad array of people who fall into that enterprise scope, um, we can actually lower the barriers and provide these opportunities for people from different countries, people who are non-native speakers, people who have uh, accessibility challenges to be able to be considered in the scope of what this technology can do and how it can improve their lives and their opportunities. I think that's, you know, that's a real, uh, it's a real blessing to be able to, to reach out to those people and it's good business sense. That's I right. think in terms of companies, um, if you haven't thought or even didn't even know that a particular audience would potentially use your software, could, they may not have considered it themselves. But if you're actually spending the time to talk to them, you may have opened up this audience and broadened a scope of audience you didn't even know you had. So yeah. now you've just gained a loyal because uh, certainly people are thinking, hey, someone considered me. Um, like, you know, for instance, I always kind of use the example of, of sunscreen. Um, the sunscreen makers, people don't make sunscreen for people like me. People like me, they think they don't need sunscreen. Guess what? I need sunscreen. And if I had sunscreen that didn't make me look all chalky, I'd buy that sunscreen. But sunscreen makers don't consider people like me. But then there was a group of women who made sunscreen for people like me. Yeah. I'm gonna buy that sunscreen 
every day <laughs> because people actually thought of me. So for businesses, that opportunity to broaden your scope of people who are in your consideration set and make them loyal customers, that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I love that. You know, one of the, is something, a phrase that always, that really has been in my head a lot is a phrase that one of our, our senior managers, uh, Patrick Ashamala always says, and it says getting out of our own way, right? And he, he's always, he refers to that when we're talking about uh, sometimes designers is like, how do we get out of our own way so that we can design the best thing, you know? And I think about that um, when we think about designing for users is how, how do we get the technology out of the way so that people can do what they came in there to do, right? Um, you know, and, and for, you know, for a lot of the work that we do, people um, only want to use these things like once a year or like once a month or whatever it, whatever it is, right? Because they're not using, it's not like an, it's not typically an everyday thing, most of, most of the users. And so basic, how do we get them so that, how do we get them uh, the sort of the, this experience, this, this technology out of the way so that they can do the thing that they need to do in the easiest, in the easiest way possible so they can get back to doing the thing that really matters, which is to them, which is doing their job, right? Um, yeah, and I and I love I love what you just said. Um, you know, the, this opportunity to reach a market that maybe you weren't even aware of. And I know you have a ton of examples of that, JD, of, of people that you've interviewed um, uh, and and areas that you've worked at um, as well. Yeah, I think. Uh... I think what's exciting for me about the company I work at now is our our customers are often people who technology is not the thing that's the most important for them. They're trying to run their their shop, their their plumbing or their electricity, you know, service titan create software for, you know, your essential workers, your your plumbers, your electrician, your HVAC, your spool and pool and spa, your pest control. And and it's amazing these, the way these people really care about the homeowners or the people who they service. So that's their focus. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to just make their ability to service the homeowners or their renter or their, their customers easier. Um, we're supposed to be able to look at a broad array of who that customers are. It could be, I run a plumbing shop in a, a low income neighborhood and I really want to be sure that I, I, the degree to which I want to serve my customers is no less than the person who, you know, has very, um, is running their plumbing shop in very expensive neighborhoods or Bel Air. We all have plumbing. <laughs> all of our sinks stop up, but the shop that wants to serve their customers doesn't want to, um, there's no, there's no difference in the degree to which they want to be able to be really impactful and serve that those needs but we have to understand what the differences are in how they serve those needs um and i think that's that's super impactful in terms of us making sure that that barrier for those customers is low so that they can do their jobs um feel good uh gain improve their business and then go home to their dogs and their cats and their kids um, so that's always what's in the back of, of my head is for the broadest array of people, how can we bring that barrier down to allow them to be the best that they can be for their community and their, and their business? Yeah, it's good. So you both have mentioned uh, blue collar workers and, and um, the kind of broadening of these you know, audiences and maybe challenging a little bit of you know, the, the, the typical people that in your jobs, most people talk to the target audiences. What was your motivation for that initially? And, and, and kind of wondering also about, you know, how lived experience may have played into that or are, are those related or could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on how, how you initially kind of felt drawn towards this kind of work or maybe even activated to do this? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I am, um, you know, I come from a, a, a blue collar, you know, immigrant family. I mean, my parents are from Mexico and uh, they're from rural areas. And, you know, and I think about, um, you know, I think about, you know, where, where I came from. And I think that's, that's what's so, that's also important, you know, and 
um, is I, you know, I think about where I came from and, and, and I think about my own family. I think about my aunts and uncles. I think about some of my brothers, you know, who are, you know, doing contract work and, you know, I, and, you know, I, I understand from speaking to them, you know, what they're trying to do in their everyday lives, what their goals are. It's like, you know, I'm trying to raise my family. I'm trying to do the best that I can, but I also have maybe these other aspirations. I had this aspiration to grow my business. I had this aspiration, um, you know, to made, to send my kids to college. And so for me, you know, when I think about, you know, I, I, I work, you know, at SAP and, 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 you know, a, a good deal of our, of, of our software. I mean, just depending on, on our, our customers, you know, a lot of the stuff that we work on is very white collar. I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, blue collar workers that need our services as well. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there. Right. And so you, when you go into a, a position, you bring your lived experiences. And, you know, I think about as I've come into this position and, um, and, and, and luckily have been very much encouraged by my management too, is to think about the perspective of the blue collar worker um, and, um, and, and searching out like, hey, we, you know, these are the folks that we need to talk to, um, realizing that, that there's been a, a real gap there. Um, and I think, you know, what I do is I, you know, I, 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 I go back to sort of those experiences and I think, um, you know, I think about the perspectives. I remember, you know, uh, maybe like a year or so ago, we were creating these personas, um, these employee personas. And, um, and I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about the blue collar worker. And what was I, you know, I was thinking about all those conversations that I had with my family members, with, with my parents, my parents' uh, friends, and um, using that, using those experiences to get into the mindset of like, what are their goals? You know, how does this work? Um, and really, really, you know, really thinking about that from the first, from that lived experience. And I think, you know, that to me said a lot about, you know, when you're thinking about, um, creating a team, when you're thinking about creating a research team, you know, the importance of, of, of getting people who can draw from the, a variety of people who can draw from those experiences, not just like black and brown people, but thinking about people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm the first per I'm one of I'm first generation college student. So I think that's an important um, perspective too. Um, you know, uh, Harvard Business Review in Janu January, February issue just um, uh, just published this article about um, the 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 lost dimension of of diversity and it was socioeconomic status. Um, and how that's very much correlated with with racial racial diversity too, but um, those experiences for me are what have bought, brought to the forefront like the, the, these are important considerations and I can and I see that um, I can push I can I can sort of push my own management to say, hey, this is an important perspective. this is an important voice. Um, so anyway, that th those are that's a long that's a long answer to your question, but yeah. <laughs> No, super important, Evelyn. I think, you know, we're all, we all bring ourselves to work, right? You know, <laughs> just because we work, we don't leave ourselves behind, you know? I think, you know, for me, uh, I'm youngest of a big family, single mom. Um, so for me, kind of starting to think, I'd always kind of been thinking in, in the back of my head, wherever I worked, of like, you know, let's, let's think broadly and let's understand when you, when, when we're recruiting, you know, as, his research, I think that the area that people oftentimes don't think about is how to recruit in a way where you're considering a broad array of people. I think it's very, it's very chic for people to say, we talk to customers and people start talking to the same kinds of people, um, either the people who are the most emphatic or you know, the people who are the closest to them. Um, so as, as a researcher over the years, you know, the, you learn your experiment design and you have your target audience, but what are the degrees of that target audience? So certainly there is craft and understand how to be sure that you um, recruit a diverse array of people within your target audience. Um, but it probably wasn't until last year when there was a lot of discussion um, last summer about what are the opportunities that we are are not 
bringing in, creating opportunities for people of color, for people who are marginalized, for people who potentially aren't considered. Um, so as I thought about that, I thought, you know, I'm probably not necessarily the person who will go protest on the streets, but could I be more thoughtful in mm -hmm. how I do my job? Could I consider people who potentially aren't generally considered? What, what could I do? What little bit could I do to bring more people into the room and give them a seat at the table? So I went to my team and, and I said, you know, I, I think I want to do this. I think I want to see if we can just reach out to more a diverse array of people. Let's consider the the BIOPOC, the LGBT, LGBTQIA plus. Let's consider the non-native speakers. Let's include their voices in our research and let's be more intentional about bringing them into the room and including them into our recruitment criteria. Um, and, you know, it, it's been interesting. It's such a, um, including people is, can be such a, a polarizing decision. Um, we kind of decided we were just gonna keep it on the DL and bring in more people and be more diverse. We weren't gonna make a big deal about it. And I th one of the reasons why is I, I thought about this is oftentimes people have this gut reaction when you say we're gonna bring in more people, they think it means excluding them. Or, or the other people who they thought were the majority. It's like, no, no, there's, guess what? There's room, there's room, there's, <laughs> it doesn't mean that if we bring in more people, it shoves people out, there's room on the boat. <laughs> so let's, let's bring more people in and at least hear their voices and consider them. So that's kind of, kind of where my thinking was, is how can we, bring in the underrepresented people and that those opportunities for people to um, contribute to how we think about how we design our products and services in a way that would broaden their opportunities and broaden our market. So it's a win-win. Um, so for me, it was really about bringing my own lived experiences as, um, you know, a, a, a middle-aged African-American woman um, with a growing up with a single mom and, and oftentimes feeling like I hadn't been considered. How could I do a little bit to consider others? Yeah, you know, I really love what you said and I, I don't want the people who are listening to miss that because I think that's so important. You know, something that you said, um, you know, you were saying, you know, maybe I, I'm not the type to go out, maybe I don't have the opportunity to go out and protest, right, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I know that I can make an impact in this way in my job. And I think that is so important. As a matter of fact, um, I think there's a huge impact that can be made. There's probably people here listening from all sorts of tech companies, um, all sorts of um, different different areas um, of the workplace. And you know, I think that's so important is recognizing that we all have access. We have we each have access to distinct um, people and resources. Right, right where we are. You don't, you don't have to go to DC. You don't necessarily have to go be a lobbyist or a politician, but where you are is so key. And it's, and you know, I, I don't think any of that is by coincidence, right? Um, there, there's something that has brought you there um, and, and you bring your specific skills and your specific talents to that. And what can you do right where you are? We can all do something right where we are um, to, to address the issues that are important to us. This, you know, if, if you're passionate about a diversity and inclusion, which I think most people who are probably listening are, you know, I think what an opportunity, if you haven't thought about it, it's like right where you are um, in your organization, um, in your community, uh, in your particular job role, with the skills and the talents that you have, like there is something that you can do. Yeah, I think that's key. I think that's a really great point um, for sharing. Yeah, it's it's it does allow each of us to think how we can contribute. It's it's certainly easy to sit back and go, "That's horrible," 
um, or to be, you know, really emotionally impacted when you, you see different inequities. But thinking to yourself, what, what can I actually contribute? How can I, um, again, within my own job, within the realm of where I am today, what can I, what can I bring to the table? And so in inclusion and in just bringing in other voices, uh, you know, that's a, that's a fairly simple thing. Well, it's actually not been that simple. <laughs> and let me talk about that a little bit. Um, it's really fascinating. I think, I think it is, the first thought about it is we're gonna bring more voices to the table. That's been our, our thought. Um, it's been really fascinating because um, inclusion is more complex than people think. The people who oftentimes don't have a seat at the table, um, there's a real complex dynamic that happens. We found that as we've reached out to some people, particularly people who've been able to build their own businesses and particularly people who are underrepresented, women-owned shops, people of color, sometimes they don't wanna be considered othered. They've spent their whole life not wanting to be thought of as othered. And so you're like, we wanna hear you because you're not part of the majority. And they're like, yeah, but I don't wanna talk about that. So I don't wanna even be thought of, and then there's a couple things. They might be thinking, I don't wanna be the flavor of the month. You're just asking me now, and I've been who I am for X number of years, and I've been running my shop fine. So there's that, and then there's, I don't want to be in the other pot because I've spent most of my life trying to achieve and not be thought of as other. Mm. So it's a really complex dynamic. It's not just as simple as come on in. Um, we want to hear from you now. It, it's a lot more sensitive than people think. And it's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated than people think just in terms of just opening up the door. So I, I'd love your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a, a good point, right? We don't, I think as researchers, we have to be careful that we're not just going into a place or, you know, virtually into someone's home or office, right? Which is typically how we're doing a lot of research now. Um, and, and, and sort of um, rating, rating their space, their knowledge, their everything, right? Rating it, rating it. And, and, and leaving them sort of thinking, okay, well, I just spilled out my guts to you. And, you know, what do I get in return? Right. I think that's so key. That's so important. Um, because, you know, some of the, some of the things that we um, talk to people about are, are, are sensitive, right. And, and there's a, there's a vulnerability, especially when you're talking about work-related things where, you know, you might be talking about, um, you know, uh, what, what are sort of the dynamics between you and your manager, or your work team. And, and sometimes people are, are scared to talk about those things, right? Because um, they're not good. They're not, they're not, you know, those things aren't good. And so how do you, um, how do you help pe people feel supported? How do you help people feel supported? Um you know, obviously get information that's helpful for, for, for what you're, for the goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and at the same time, make people feel heard, you know, make people feel heard, make people feel like, um, what they said is more than a, more than some data that you're collecting, but it's an important story that needs to be told for, for something greater. Right. How do you yeah, I mean, preserve of, that? Oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Well, there's a lot of vulnerability in, in reaching out to people who haven't been heard before. There's a lot of potential, a lot of hurt. There's a lot of worry about, you know, whether people see them as different. I think you, there's a lot of sensitivity. I think you're, you're really spot on there, Elena. It's, it's how do you make them, allow them to feel heard and empowered, not taken from. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's. Important. Yeah. What are your tips for that, JD and Adelina? Like, if for, for people who are out here looking to start an initiative or looking to be more inclusive in the way that they're doing design or, or research, you know, what are some practices that you've observed that have been successful in, in creating safe spaces for people? Um, I think. I, th I think a lot of it has to do with um, how you approach people just in just in your your everyday right um, I um, you know when I 
when I do research, I, I try to first really establish rapport, right? Opti really, really get into like, hey, I'm really interested in, in, in who you are as a person. Um, and I want to know about you, right? What's valuable to you? Um, I think as opposed to coming in and just saying, all right, how do you use this thing? I need to know, you know, um, hopefully nobody's doing that. You know, that's obviously an exaggeration, but hopefully nobody's doing that. Uh, I do think that we live in a day and time where people have um, really have, um, they uh, underestimate the importance of building rapport with people, of having that human contact, of having that, um, establishing that human connection. It is so important. It is so important uh, in a day and time where we have people that feel the lo most, the loneliest, where we have people that feel the most disconnected. Um, it is so important. And I think as researchers, we, we, have, um, we have the opportunity to establish that connection and say, you know, I hear you, I hear you. You know, I've, I've talked to people where I, you know, sometimes in, in, in research interviews where I know that they, they, they haven't been heard by anybody. I mean, they, they're like, man, I just need to get this thing off my chest about work. And I just think like, wow, you know? Um, and I think that, that, first of all, so that, 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 that rapport, making people feel heard, right. And making them feel like, and also giving them that space to say, if this is not something you want to talk about, we don't have to talk about it. Only whatever, you, only talk to me about whatever you feel comfortable sharing, right? Um, and I, I also um, like to really uh, tell people like, um, you know, how this is going to, you know, this information that, that you're giving me, this is the potential for what it's going to be used for. You know, maybe you don't give every single detail, right? But th this is what we're thinking about. You know, this is what we're trying to improve. And I think that also helps people recognize, um, okay, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's another purpose, you know, that might be helpful because usually pe people don't just want to help themselves. They usually want to help other people, right? And so when you allow them when you are able to communicate to them that, you know, this, this research that we're doing, it's not just about, um, you know, um, some random thing, but it's really like our goal is to help in this way. I think um, communication is key and that, and that, um, that human connection always. I totally agree. I think, you know, part of what's, what's special about doing research is um, the rapport that, connection. I, I always tell my students at Art Center, when you are when you are doing research and you are conducting an interview or observing someone in their work environment, they should feel like they are the most important person in the world at that moment in time. Your job is to make that person feel like they are the king of the world. Nothing that they can do for this point of time when you're interacting with them will be wrong. And your job is to be completely there and present for them. That's no different when you're having that relationship or having those, those communications with um, being inclusive. You're really supposed to be 100% present for, for that participant. Um, and really being empathetic, watching their body language, their eyes, their gestures, you were, that is, you know, part of the, the craft is being 100% there for that person. Um, and that's, that's the research craft as it is. And it doesn't, you know, it's the same as when you're bringing in a person who's underrepresented as anybody else. Being 100% present and empathetic and listening for them. I love that. I, JD, you're always dropping those wisdom nuggets. Yeah, absolutely. Making them feel like they're the most important person in the room. I love that because um, most of the time people in their jobs, they don't feel that way, <laughs> you know, in their jobs or even in their everyday, right? And so what a gift, what a gift it is to give that to people um, in, in, as researchers. I love that. I love that. Great. JD, you talked a little bit about craft um, of research. I, I'd like to maybe, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and um, 
And, and what, what, what do you mean when you say craft? I think oftentimes we, we talk about designers starting to, starting to take on a bit more of a research role, especially when doing usability testing and things like that. And, you know, and multiplying and enabling other people in our organization to conduct interviews. So this craft, if you could elaborate more on, on what you mean by that and, and when we do start to scale research, how does, how is that preserved? Yeah, I think the craft of research is, is oftentimes, I think people uh, can get really, I think people, it's easy to kind of think of research either has a very non-design um, skill um, that, you know, those people, research people do it, um, or um, people can think, um, well, everybody does it. Everybody can, um, but it is a craft in the same way that, you know, certainly everybody can cook, but then there are people who really do cooking as a craft. I don't cook. So I personally <laughs> think about people who cook and who cook well, there's a nuance in thinking about how you approach that process. Um, you know, when you're cooking, you're, you're potentially have a recipe, but when do you, when do you deviate? Um, how do you balance flavors? How do you, you know, what does the weather or the temperature or your oven temperature, all of those things are part of the craft. The same is true of research. It's a craft, you design an experiment. You design the degree, the, the array of your participants. Um, it's not, I think uh, it can be very easy for designers to think of research as, well, you know, I'm gonna give a deliverable. I'm gonna talk to some people and I'm gonna have a deliverable. Um, it really is a method. There is a, a process and a method to, to research when you're approaching it in a way that's thorough and thoughtful and considerate and empathetic, um, which again, opens up your eyes to let's be sure I, we include more people because in that array of people who you're recruiting, you know that you're looking for themes and insights and nuances that are gonna be the things that really push innovation. Yeah. So craft is a lot about being sure that you understand the method how do I recruit people? How do I come up with my, with our assumptions? How do we even be sure that we understand that what we're thinking is a hypothesis and assumption and actually listen to customers or listen to our users so we can compare and contrast what we thought with what we hear from them. And oftentimes people are complex creatures. What people say and what they do and what they say they do are all different things. So the craft of being able to tell the difference, being able, the craft of being able to ask a question in a way that's not leading and really listening to your customer or your user and being able to say, so I heard you say this, tell me, tell me more about that. Being just fascinated and again, 100% there for them so that you can bring out the, those nuances and help them explore their thoughts and feelings. Um, so all of that is part of the craft, taking that information and looking for themes, not always necessarily explicit information. Uh, I think one of the, the key areas in the craft is um, not just listening for a user to tell you uh, what they like or, or what to do, but really inferring. So inferring is also part of the craft. Um, and again, this all is, is just expanded when you're talking about being more inclusive and bringing more people into the room is what the nuance is, what they're inferring, and this is the beautiful part, this is where the inclusion makes such an impact, is what they're inferring can be completely different or just slightly different than the majority. So that listening, that craft of hearing and listening is so essential to, to what we do and the privilege of what we have, have the opportunity to do is hear people, make sure they're heard, look for patterns, make connections. That's, that's really what I feel is the craft. I mean, I, I like your thoughts. Yeah, I love, I love that. I love the way you, uh, you describe that, right? Because I, um, across my career, I've, you know, you, you've always run into those people's like, oh, just come up with some, I can come up with some questions. You know, um, it, it's interesting, you know, people are just like, I'm, I'll just throw together a, a survey and, you know, anybody can do that. And um, 
really anybody can come up with a survey, but oh, we started about surveys. <laughs> we started about the craft of survey. Oh, don't get me started. Yeah, and that's like a com that's a common occurrence. You know, people just kind of think, well, anybody can do that. Anybody can talk to some people. Um, but you're right, it's a craft. There's a there's it, it it's a you know, there are skills that that go with it. And um, you know, a lot of us have spent years building that craft, right? So um, I think that's 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 important to really emphasize. And I love it. I love that. Um, you know, that's something that we're really pushing right now at SAP is, is the enablement of, um, of designers. And I, I love teaching. So, you know, that's one of my passions. So I love talking to designers who are saying, hey, you know, I'm really curious about um, UX research. And, um, you know, I want to learn some things. I'm like, great, let's, let, you know, let's go through it. And uh, I had the opportunity actually to talk to a couple of uh, designers this week this week or, or last week, I can't remember now. Um, and, you know, they're, they're so curious that, you know, they want to know and, um, you know, how, how to, you know, how to do this, how to, how to gauge, you know, how to ask the right questions. And um, I think that's, that's really important. It's really important to, um, to multiply, multiply our knowledge, right? Um, I think it's going it, to, it can only help designers be better designers. Um, I think it would help engineers be better engineers. Um, product managers be better product managers is really trying to, um, to get at, you know, how, how do we get at this information? How do we get at the essence of, of people's experiences, um, at the essence of their needs? How do we get at those things? And I think um, it's an important skill. It's an important craft to, to continually be building, right? Even as researchers, it's something that um, we have to continually practice. Um, I think, you know, you, you know, JD, probably, you know, there are things that, you know, there's interviews you can do, you know, while, probably while driving, right? It just becomes second nature um, to listen to people, but it's, but it's like a muscle. You have to constantly be in practice of it. Um, you know, if you don't, you have to, you have to continually use it. And I'm a curious person. I've, I've always been a curious person since I was a kid. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I always, I used to, ask, I was the kid that, you know, I'm sure a lot of kids do this, you know, kids ask, you know, the awkward questions that, you know, no adult is going to ask. And I used to ask a lot of those questions. Um, <laughs> and so I was, and I have stayed curious and I would say that's, that's one skill I would say, stay curious, stay curious about people, um, not just for research purposes, but we live in a day and time where our society is so divided and so polarized and um, we're easy to cancel and dismiss each other. And I think we need to stay curious about each other. Um, I'm constantly trying to read and understand, you know, why, why, you know, why, you know, certain people do what they do. Right. And I'm just staying curious because at the end of the day, what I really, really, you know, there's this, there's this part of our humanity who wants to understand and empathize and, 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 you know, make some sense of, you know, what makes people tick or why people decided to do this thing, right? Um, I think that it's in us, like you said, we all have the, uh, the, the uh, capacity to do it, but it's, you know, do, do we decide um, to invest in building that craft and building those skills. And I think that's what makes um, a huge difference, right? Um, and I would say staying curious is such an important um, tactic in, in being a, a good researcher. If, you, if you're not a researcher yet, and um, I think staying curious, staying um, interested, right? And, 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 and then the rest is really investing in, in, in the craft of, of you know, building questions, being able to make sense of, of the themes of the data, you know, the, as, as JD already mentioned, I think is super important. And I also think uh, another part of that is the critical thinking part. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my husband's a, a designer um, who also, a graphic designer who went from graphic design to, to UX to product design. Um, and, you know, it's the it's the critical thinking aspect. You know, another aspect of the craft, Kevin, is um, moving from form to function to that critical discourse with yourself 
um, in terms of, you know, I always say um, good design is, is a, a series of uh, informed trade-offs. It's an exercise in critical thinking. Um, you're, you're understanding who your users are, their goals, how to prioritize those goals against the business goals, um, how to um, be sure that you're thinking of a long-term aspect for the user, for the business. There are all this, these critical thinking decisions you're making. Um, so another part of the craft is really switching from thinking only of the, the outcome and thinking of the method and the practice of what goes into creating the form and bringing those two together is, is really critical in terms of evolving craft. Yeah. You know, I, I was looking at, there's a question from one of my uh, ex PhD students, uh, Sharon, uh, Dr. Sharon uh, now. Uh, <laughs> um, and so uh, this is a really important question because oftentimes people, uh, you know, there, there's some stakeholders who will, who will try to rush you through the process and not realize that, that it is very time and labor intensive to do research, especially when you're doing qualitative research, right? Um, and I think that's where you have to bring people into the process. I need you to, you as a stakeholder, I'm gonna invite you to these interviews so that you can see, you can see how, first of all, how much data, and I want you to take notes, right? Um, and obviously you're not gonna say it in that way, but hey, you know, this would, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to um, come and understand the user, come and understand the, the audience that, that we're dealing with. And it would be helpful if you took notes for me. And people can see the, the, the labor that it takes, right? Because there's, there, there's the interview, there's the note taking, there's the, um, the, the finally an analyzing the data, which is very, can be lab very labor intensive. Um, I think if you can bring people into the process um, and, and so that they can understand, um, and that's what, that's definitely, we like to do that at SAP. We bring in, uh, uh, we invite the product managers, we invite the, the designers um, to, to observe, to take notes as well. Um, and, and they start to see, wow, this is, uh, this is, you know, this, this takes a lot of time, you know, and, and um, I think also setting expectations at the beginning, this is, this is, this is the expectation that you, um, that you should have about, uh, about how long it's going to take me, you know, to analyze the data. I like to set expectations at the forefront. I always give people um, an overview of what I'm going to do and how long it's going to take. And, and we're going to come to that understanding at the beginning because um, uh, I don't want there to be a miscommunication when we get to that part and you say you never understood, you never knew. I think communication is key, but I think them sort of experiencing it for themselves and understanding this is, this is a labor intensive. And even in the analysis part, building themes, you can bring in those stakeholders to say, okay, come and do this, um, move these sticky notes with me, right? Um, in, in essence, uh, and they can see it, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I saw another question here about doing surveys and, and research with vulnerable populations. And I think that when, it, I, I know JD, you mentioned quickly about, uh, uh, surveys, but I, I have been hearing, you know, many instances, you know, in, in, in my job about people wanting research to go faster, was leaner, lighter, faster research. I guess one of my, one of the resorts that people go to is, well, let's just do more surveys. But, um, you know, is that at the expense of inclusion, I guess, is <laughs> really the, maybe my, my first toe in the water with that question. Yeah, I, I, I have a whole, again, survey creation is a, is a craft, being sure that the, the question is not biasing and being sure that you're um, actually, the whole issues of panels, having survey panels, um, whether you buy a panel or you have one within your company, again, that's an opportunity for, if you haven't considered people who are not easily accessible, you know, what is the effort that you're willing to go to to bring in more people if you can't buy them from a particular source um, or you haven't considered them ever for your customer or your end user. 
Um, so there's the recruiting aspect, being sure you have a diverse um, and large enough audience because you, for surveys, you have to have a larger sample size to be able to get the quantitative data and be sure that it's representative of percentage of your population. Um, I think people think about surveys as an easy answer. We'll just survey six people or we'll survey eight people. Um, that's not really a survey. <laughs> so for, you know, for the record, that's not really a survey. Um, that's not a quantitative survey. That's a question um, that you probably would have been better asking qualitatively than trying to get a numerical data from, from that small number of people. Um, but there's a whole practice around the proper creation of survey questions that um, so they're not biasing. And it's not just to be you know, academic or pedantic. It's um, how I always say people's behavior uh, clusters around a mean. It's easier to see um, patterns in behavior. And most often survey questions are about attitudes and attitudes are much more diverse and dispersed and polarized. So you actually have to have the right questions and the right number of people to have get good data back. So there's a reason why survey creation is difficult. Um, and sometimes doing a survey the wrong way and getting bad data can be even worse than not having any data at all because it can lead you down the wrong road. So. That's kind of why I'm emphatic about being sure that when surveys are done, that quantitative done, it's not um, it's not superficial or quasi quantitative data. Um, because again, it's it can be the road to leaving people out, and you know it's automatically not inclusive if you don't approach it in the right way. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you know, Kevin, you were talking about, um, you know, this, this need for, you know, faster, sort of faster research, right? Um, and I think, um, I think there are opportunities to do that, right? But uh, you also, you have to have a team that's willing, you know, you have your stake involving your stakeholders, right? Um, I think that's, uh, when I've done studies where they want a quick turnaround, I was like, well, you know, I, I, I get the people involved who want that quick turnaround. <laughs> And say if you listen in, you know that's that's gonna that that is going to uh, probably speed up the process of your understanding, um, and um, I think we put a lot of emphasis sometimes on deliverables, on the beauty of deliverables, on um, on on the perfection of deliverables, and I think you, you that's that's a consideration too. Uh, if you are wanting a quick turnaround. Uh, then you're not going to have like a perfect deliverable. And at the end of the day, how important is that, right? You have to ask yourself that if this is a, a, a quick sort of iteration on a design, for instance, that you're trying to test, that per the perfection of a deliverable is probably not that important. So, um, you know, there are things that you have to, there are things that you have to sort of weigh. Mm -hmm. So maybe changing directions a little bit, I wanted to ask, uh, it, it, research seems to be trending earlier in, in the design process and, and focusing on usability testing, uh, from focusing on usability testing to really influencing product strategy or even you know, experience strategy. And so with that changing role of research from kind of being at, towards the end of the process, it, well, the design process, like relatively speaking, towards the end of the design process to now being earlier, um, where the impact of your insights could potentially, um, uh, you know, change a lot more down, down the line. Uh, what added responsibilities and considerations should researchers understand in this changing role? And also as maybe design students who have gravitated from design into research and now thinking that research, okay, well, I actually like strategy too. You know, what, what, what are these considerations that, that we should be making in, um, in that kind of new uh, role? Maybe Adelina, I, I could start with you on, on that question. Oh, I was gonna let JD start. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we kind of, we've chatted a little bit about this and I think the, yeah. the opportunity for designers 
to, um, to be critical thinkers because they get the opportunity, you know, over the years, oftentimes designers have, have really pushed back on not having a seat at the table. You know, somebody else does their balsamic wireframes and hands them to a designer and says, execute on that, which is, you know, can be really demotivating for designers. And more and more um, designers are, are getting a seat at the table. And part of that is taking on the strategic responsibility and thinking having to do with doing discovery or earlier strategic research. Part of their opportunity now is to art also be critical thinkers about having that responsibility to ask who are we recruiting? Who are we including Who and why? Um, and having those conversations um, that they, some designers might have said, oh, somebody else will do that. Now it's a responsibility and part of the skill of the designer to have those critical discussions about, you know, who are we solving for? What are their motivations? What are their goals? Um, what are what are what do they constitute as success um, in terms of the audience? What does the business constitute as a success? How can we how can we make those those trade offs? So now, as a designer, the the opportunity in terms of growth is to to concentrate not just on the form, but all of the information and the thinking and the critical thinking that that informs, that, that actually leads to the form. Um, so there's a real opportunity there for growth um, and for the opportunity to be strategic and to be able to guide and not just be on the delivery um, wireframe concept side where somebody else has handed it to you. And also that's where the oftentimes in the beginning is the opportunity for strategic differentiating, um, to be able to be a strategic differentiator because you're not just handed something at the end. Oftentimes if you're handed something at the end, it's a short time frame. Um, you're wondering, well, why did we decide to do this in the first place? That opportunity for the designer um, comes with the responsibility though of asking those critical thinking questions earlier before they get to the deliverable or the design. Um, that's kind of where I see the growing opportunity for, for designers and design students is to not necessarily, I think there's a, there's a camps of let's, let's make first, we'll make something and then we'll work backward or let's start with who and you know, the macro and then work forward and then think forward. So I think it's the opportunity for the designer to um, take off their, their making first hat in those opportunity, in those situations where it's appropriate and start with, with who first. I think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for designers. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think uh, it is, I, I see it as an opportunity. I think for so long, people have been so siloed right? The engineers do what they do. The designers do what they do. The product managers do what they do. And um, you're brought into the conversation at the time where your part is needed. And I think that's, those silos are being broken down uh, as they should, right? To, to make a comprehensive, um, concept, pro comprehensive experiences, products, et cetera. Um, it, it, it is an opportunity. And I think it's, goes back to the being a, a, a constant learner, right? Understanding, well, where's the business headed? Where's the business headed? Uh, where's this product or service headed? Um, not just I'm designing this thing, but understanding what, what's, this, what's the business strategy? Um, and also recognizing that as a UX designer or as a UX researcher, um, there's a set of, of, of of experiences, there's a set of understanding and expertise that you bring to the table, right? You have an understanding of uh, maybe what the users need, maybe because you've, you know, you've talked to them. Uh, designers come with an understanding of interaction, of, of you know, what what what's the what's the standard at this point um, with how you know potentially how things uh, how interaction works, how things are used. Um, 
And so I think you have to marry all those things and not, not sort of um, be sort of short-sighted in just this, this little area, this thing that I do, I'm the designer and that's all I do, but be open to constantly having your ears open and understanding well, where, where's this going um, and being able to speak to that. Okay. So yes, I, I, I'm the designer, but now I understand, you know, where, um, the, where the vision is headed. Uh, do I agree? Do I disagree? Right. And having those conversations saying, look, I, I disagree from this pers perspective because I know this, right. Um, I've definitely had to be in conversations like that, where I was in, um, in, in meetings with uh, product managers and designers, and they had this notion of where this particular aspect of a product was going. Um, and, I'm, I'm the researcher, right? So, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's not what, that's not what users need and being able to, to be that voice. And, and at that moment, it was, um, it's not necessarily, it, it, it's being the voice of the user when the user is not in the room. Um, and oftentimes it's advocating for the user saying like, people aren't going to use that. Or, um, you know, we talk, we talk to people, let's, let's, let's design it in this way. This is my understanding of it. And really, uh, being willing to push back, right? Um, and you know, I there was a particular conversation where we were designing something, and I and I was put, I was the only one in the room pushing back, right, in in the virtual room, and um, and you know, everybody was kind of like, oh my god, well now what are we going to do? Because you know, in their head they had sort of set this timeline for um, when things needed to be done. We need to be done with this by this time because we need to test it by this time. And I said, well, we don't have anything to test. I'm not testing, you know, and in a very, you know, very, very judicious, very, you know, very, uh, very nice, um, but very honest uh, way of saying like, hey, we don't, we don't have anything to test right now, you know, and uh, we finally, we finally got to a really good place. And what we ended up with was good, was really good. Um, it tested really well. And we got a lot of great feedback. Um but I, to me, that was, that was just an example of you trust, trust the knowledge, trust the expertise that you come with, um, and, and be willing to, um, w when you're at the table, being willing to use your voice, right. Being able to use your voice when you don't necessarily agree with the direction, but that also takes understanding, well, um, more about the the whole product of understanding uh, what what's the vision where are we headed right um, and it's constantly staying curious and 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 being willing to learn um, I think is important. You know I, I also think that there's a great opportunity when we talk about bringing in more people into the room whether that's the virtual room or the actual room is um, a lot of designers kind of bristle at the idea of participatory design. Um, bringing in stakeholders and users at the very beginning and really creating that strategy where you're hearing from people and looking for patterns. Um, you know, that's a great opportunity for inclusion is being sure that literally you're bringing in a broad array and diverse array of perspectives, socioeconomic, um, ethnicity, uh, age into the room to have those discussions um, with people, a lot of people where things are, are early in the process and really bringing in that information for this collaborative and co-creative opportunity. I think a lot of designers tend to bristle at that idea, um, but there's a, a lot of, particularly for um, inclusion, there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, for sure. So you, you both have worked within enterprise um, or do work within enterprise software companies. And when it comes to testing designs or you know, even from a strategic standpoint, the implications of, of your design are scales typically quite large, right? So at, at SAP, you have you know, hundreds of thousands, even I, I, mil millions of users is it, is it? Anyway, yeah, I think it's millions. <laughs> I don't think I'm overstating there. <laughs> but you know, we're, we're looking at technology and, 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 and in the way that it's going to be used by essentially the public, right? Really large audiences. So when it also comes to like testing, like an Envision prototype, for instance, which is representing technology or representing what an AI or an ML is going to do, you know, how is machine learning factored into this? How is artificial intelligence surfaced in this way? When it comes to testing technology like that, um, 
I, I'd be curious to hear maybe a little bit more about um, how, how, how is that conveyed to people? How are you including people in, in how does this AI act? How does this AI interact with you? What is it learning about me as a, as a user? And how am I building a relationship with that and understanding what's going on behind the scenes through this flat prototype? So what I'm really asking here is these, the, the, the way we are kind of faking intelligence and the way that we're testing concepts, and then supposed to sort of uh, get feedback on that. How are you sort of making those bridges connect, especially maybe with people who aren't as tech savvy? That is a good question, Kevin. That's a good question. I'm really curious what JD has to say about it, but I'm just going to share a little bit about um, what, you know, kind of what I've done in the past. With, um, and it's really hard to mimic, you know, in AI in just like this flat prototype. But one of the strategies that I've used in the past is, um, getting personal information about people, <laughs> getting personal information about our users beforehand, right? Um, because you, because for me, it's really important when you do AI uh, research, if you don't have real AI, um, is, is to simulate a, a real experience. And you're not going to simulate that if you don't know anything about them, right? So, um, you know, what I typically do is I will get information about them, um, you know, whatever's relevant to the particular product that we're using, you know, whether it's like what they do, what their, you know, what their, you know, sort of interests are at work, um, you know, their previous learning experiences, et cetera. Um, and then plug in that information into what they're going to see, getting them sort getting them into a real mindset, getting them to, um, getting them into a realistic environment is so, is so important, um, especially for testing something that's supposed to be AI. And so, you know, that's always been my strategy is, um, what might they expect to see based on, um, what we can learn about them, right? And so creating sort of a realistic experience as much as possible uh, for people um, is really important. So that's what, you know, that's one thing um, that I've that I've done in the past. And I think um, it has, it, it's worked for, you know, for some of the things that we've done for sure. Uh, it is very, it's, it's obviously more time consuming. You know, you have to do a lot of the work up front and, um, but I, I think you know that's you know that's one of the strategies that um, that I've definitely used in my work. Yeah, I, I like what you said, Elena. I know that when I was at Yahoo, I did a lot of work with um, uh, behavioral targeting. Uh, you know, I, I did a lot of ad tech research um, back in the day. That I, I have a, a, a little bit of a little bit of regrets uh, for <laughs> for some of the work that I did at Yahoo. Were really Looking at all the different, um, all the different ways that we understand people's behavior, um, and then potentially uh, showing what we we felt at the time would be relevant information, relevant advertising. Um, so at the time, a lot of the, the ways that we we researched that was um, putting the person, giving a person a scenario, a particular set of circumstances. And then um, based on that kind of showing, you know, you're on this particular page, you're doing this kind of shopping, and then you move to this other unrelated experience. And then here is information that's related to your particular behavior from that first scenario. Um, I think what I, in retrospect, um, I think what we didn't include, and this can be kind of an area to consider when you're mimicking AI and machine learning is looking at the thresholds for people's tolerance um, in terms of making guesses. And this is where not having enough diversity in the room um, can actually really be problematic in terms of, um, this is what we anticipate people's behavior will be. Um, so we're showing them an ad or showing, giving them some additional information based on what we think is their behavior, but what is their threshold for tolerance? How should we limit that? What's respectful in terms of how, what we serve 
to them. Um, so, you know, frequency of, of showing certain kinds of information. I don't think we, we thought of those things at the time. Um, I, I didn't, or maybe I'll, I'll be personal to myself. And I don't think we, I spent enough time thinking about when you mimic those experiences for a, a broad array of people being clear, you understand the, the complexities and the thresholds of anticipating people's behavior and is your, do you have the appropriate information to anticipate what people need based on um, their actions, especially if you haven't looked at the, a broad array of people's actions and, and needs. So it can be very complicated. We've cert I've certainly done it in my career, but earlier in my career, I think as an older um, professional, I think I, I would do it differently if I had a chance to go back to my past. I certainly would do it differently in terms of being much more thoughtful um, about how you mimic that kind of targeted, behavioral targeted um, experience with customers and, and trying to get data back. Anything you want to add, Adelina? <laughs> no, I mean, turning. yeah, no, I think, I think that's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a really hard, it's tough. It's tough to, to try to mimic uh, these, these AI things, but at, at the same time, uh, it's interesting, uh, at the same time, it's these AI, these AI systems are, are trying to mimic us, right? So that, I was thinking about that, you know, um, the, the irony of that relationship um, is really interesting. I think, I, I think that we, um, you know, and, and in thinking about that, I think that we are probably more intuitive than we think about, um, what people might see or what they might want to see. Um, uh, simply, simply because, uh, we're able to think a little bit, uh, broader, 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 but then also come in a little bit, uh, more specific, um, to thinking about what people might see, but, but there is that limitation of, you don't know, you don't know your, your users that well, um, other than the limited information that, that you're gathering, at least in my case, the limited information that I'm gathering from them, um, beforehand to try to, um, create, a, a, an environment that mimics AI. So, you know, and the, and the, and the risk with AI and, 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 you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, how can we be ensure that um, AI and machine learning, you know, people generally think the machines are going to take over. They're going to rule the world. Guess what? The machines are only as smart as we train them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and again, why inclusion and diversity matters so much is if we don't have the appropriate information that we are training the algorithms. The algorithm is just a, it's just a set of rules. We make it up. <laughs> and the algorithm machine builds on that, but we set the parameters for who that includes, what those motivations and drivers and fears and goals are, are based on being sure we have a broad enough array of people so that when we're creating those rules and we are training the machine learning or AI that we are actually being sure it's representative of enough people for it to be smart. It can certainly evolve, but we train it. We give that the information to the technology. Technology isn't necessarily running away on its own. Um, <laughs> it's only going as far as we tell it to, and not far enough if we don't if we don't tell it to. So that's always something. That's again, it's a super important part of the consideration of of diversity and inclusion, particularly when we're thinking of of complex technology. Yeah, I think that's a whole other critical discourse discussion is um, is is AI technology and, and who's who's you know who are the people um, largely uh, you know working on it right and um, that's an interesting uh, topic as well that needs a lot of uh, diversity. Yes, <laughs> big time. So before we jump to the questions in the chat, I did want to ask, uh, both of you have, if you, if you hop on both of your LinkedIn's, you both talk about service design. Um, and 
in the discussion today, we've talked a lot about different stakeholders and involving them in research, the importance of research, and then this relationship with design. I wanted to ask, since service design, you don't often see those types of job titles or even necessarily a lot of programs here in the United States to do service design. And service design. There's a few, but I wanted to maybe, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit more on, you know, what is a service designer and what opportunities are there to sort of implement this type of work into the service design practice, uh, that work being inclusive design as, as a service designer, yeah. <laughs> I'll let JD. Go oh, ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I, I am the director of a service design team um, at Service Titan. And, um, you know, I think the exciting opportunity for me to come into an organization was having uh, another career before my, my technology career was in advertising. And I knew the power of understanding, the power of being able to advertise to a customer included understanding them holistically, understanding their, um, understanding, you know, the psychographics, they call it in branding, um, understanding what their experience was with, I'm going to buy a car, what is my experience going to the dealership, having that broad understanding. When I moved into technology, I was I was really um, surprised that there was a lot of emphasis on the technology, but not the customer or the user or their broader experience. So over my career, I always wanted to understand, uh, connect the dots. I always wanted to understand the holistic because people are not just compartmentalized. They're not just buying your product. They're, there's a whole set of experiences and touch points that occur before they make that purchase, whether it's researching when I was at Kelly Blue Book before they purchase a car, and then that experience when they go to the dealership or a trade show, or you know when I was at Kaiser consulting there, there's experience of, yes, you can go to the doctor, but what about your choices of doctors and how do you decide what, um, if you're going for health or wellness as opposed to being sick, how do, you, how do you have that experience? What if you're in a waiting room? So all of those things for me, were very important. I wasn't just focused on the digital experience. Um, so when I had a chance to, to, to actually run or kind of uh, lead a service design team, it was the perfect opportunity for me for to bring in a group of people that were thinking holistically, particularly for enterprise, where the onboarding experience and being sure customers who are not technology savvy um, and who oftentimes uh, enterprise software requires a certain training component, being sure that the broad array of people's level of technology and training, um, how they run their business was all considered um, in, in the, the digital experience and actually trickled down to the di digital experience. Um, so part of what a service designer does, and I have service design researchers is looking at holistically, what are the end-to-end -end touch points? What are the experiences? What are training? How does the business and the internal employees, how do they, particularly customer facing employees, how do they approach that customer so that that customer can be successful all the way from the beginning of their, um, uh, their use of the software, their training all the way through as they use it and actually evolve their business. So for, for, for our work, service design is really about that holistic end-to-end, -end, surface to core, internal customer facing employees, impact and process on the customer's not only product, but service experience. Um, there's not a lot of people who, who do service design in, um, in the US. It's very popular, of course, in Europe because um, oftentimes, um, in countries where they have social systems, where they have you know medical, that service experience, the efficiency and effectiveness of it um, is important. But there's more and more of an attitude in um, in the states where people are realizing the service, because people have so many options, is just as important. The quality of that service is just as important as the digital solution itself. Yeah. That, that's good. I think, you know, I, 
I think one of the points that, that you made, I think that's so interest that is so true and so interesting is, you know, that nothing works in a vacuum, right? Nothing that we do, it, it works in a vacuum. And, and there's all these experiences that are intertwined. And I think it's real short-sighted to look at our products, even if you work on a product team and just see it as this standalone product that you're working on. I think it's very short-sighted from the perspective of a user and how, and how people could potentially be using it or potentially um, meeting the needs of those folks. And I think that's what service design really do. It, help, it helps you look at things from um, a, a system, you know, looking at it as a system, there's all these things that we use uh, or the, the experiences. I mean, if you think about um, getting on a flight, right? Um, it's, it's not just about getting on the flight or it's not just about buying the ticket, but there, there's a whole set of experiences that surround that from um, getting on a website or getting on your phone or getting on a site and purchasing that ticket, making a decision to how you get to the airport the day of, to how do you, how do you check in? You know, all of those things make for how you feel about the experience of a flight. And at the end of the day, how you might rate it, how you might think about that airline, right? All of those things come together. And I think we need to think about our products that way. And it's so helpful. You know, I've been thinking about how my experience in service design has served me well in, in product design. Uh, I, I think about our products so differently, I think, than most people, um, uh, especially like um, our, our product managers, right? They oftentimes just think about their, their particular product that they work on. And I often think about it as like, the overall experience, all these various products that people engage with in our system, they're not thinking about the individual thing, right? They're thinking about how do I do this thing that's connected? So really service design really helps you think from a holistic and systemic uh, perspective, which is what a lot of people are thinking about. They're not thinking about this little widget or this little thing that we think about from uh, that oftentimes engineers or product managers, even designers think about because you're so focused on this product, they're thinking about their overall experience. How do I experience my HR thing? I don't know that they're all separate systems. I know that they're one system and I want it to work in this way. And I don't understand why this thing doesn't talk to this thing, right? And so I, I think that overall, we need to think about things from a service perspective, right? Because it helps broaden the experience for users as opposed to just thinking about this little, this product, which fits into this larger thing. That's not the way our users think about it. And, and that's what I love about service design. It, help, it helps us think about it from that perspective. And the opportunities are there for innovation. I mean, there are so many more opportunities for thinking, wait a minute, there's a gap. There's a gap in there because we're thinking only, if we focus only on the product, um, the digital experience, we potentially have missed this whole set of opportunities for innovation in terms of either making the customer more loyal, more successful, um, because we haven't thought of the entire end-to-end -end workflows or journey. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and again, bringing in a broader array of people so we can have a full holistic understanding of their service experience that's not just about the in digital interactions. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a lot of learning opportunity in this, right? Um, we just we did a set of workshops with one of our customers in Mexico, which was amazing. You know, we, for the first time I was able to do a, you know, design thinking, uh, workshop in, in all in Spanish. And it was, it was awesome. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. And, but it was interesting to, um, we, they were trying to solve for, um, an innovation team, right there. How would we, how would we come up with this, um, innovation team that's going to help, you know, um, our, our, our company innovate from now on. And, you know, they kept thinking about this. They kept thinking about a product that they were going to create. Well, people are going to, you know, this, this thing and, and, and really helping them to see it's not about a product. What you got, you guys are helping internally create services for employees. Think about it. And, and if you just think about the product, you don't think about everything that that thing is influenced by, or that it needs to be, um, 
or who's responsible or how you're going to have maintenance on that thing. There are other things outside of that. It's not just the standalone thing that's not a, that that's not impacted or impacts other things, but really thinking about how does this impact the the employees? How does how do the employees impact it, right? And so I, I think it was good. We were able to, uh, I think I was able to get through to them, but we'll see. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I see we have some questions in the Q&A. So if, if anybody has any additional, I, I see we also have some in the chat too, so I'll kind of bounce back and forth. But uh, one of the first ones that we have here is Julian. Um, what are some strategies for actively seeking out underrepresented groups of people for UX and CX research? Some strategies for actively seeking out underrepresented groups. Yeah. What we're trying, we're trying is going through our charter groups. We're starting with, um, we have uh, our ERGs, our employee resource, resource groups. Um, we kind of were kind of stealthily trying to be sure we broadened or created a, a database of broader customers and kind of running into these these areas where we just weren't getting any feedback so we recently started reaching out to um like really recently in the last few days <laughs> reaching out to our er our employee resource groups and saying hey do you have customers that we should talk to this is what we're trying to do we're trying to be include more people um can you can you help us? I know that in Ani Jean Baptiste's book, um, Building for Everyone, she also mentions the, the value of reaching out to the internal um, employee resource groups if you have them. So that's definitely approach that we're that we're trying right now. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, we 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 usually do. Um, we usually use respondent, right? That's one of our probably, you know, people who are on the call who do uh, UX work um, are, are familiar with respondent IO. Um, they, it, it's, it's really hard to find blue collar workers. It's really hard to find um, even people of color on there. Um, and I, it's interesting because I, and this is not something they haven't heard from me. I have had conversations with people from a respondent because I participate in their user research for researchers. And um, that's, you know, that's one of the things that I've talked to them about is you guys really need to get more diverse um, users on here. You know, we want to, we want to talk to blue collar workers. We want to talk to um, uh, people of color. And I even told them, you know, sometimes I'll say, Hey, I'm looking for this, th these, these folks, I don't see them on here. You know, when are you guys going to get them on here? And it it really takes because we're their we're their customer. So we need to demand. I think that's the thing is set that standard and say this is what I need. I mean, this is this is your business. Let's 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 get it done right. Um, I think that's really important. The other thing is um, is using uh, our networks. It, oftentimes, using our networks of um, I was working on a project and we had someone who's doing a, a fellowship with us and, and she was, she's African-American and, and I said, Hey, we, re we really need to get some blue collar workers on this. And she said, Oh, you know, I might know some people. Um, and I was like, great, let's use them. Right. Let's, let's, let's use some folks that, um, that maybe are in the network of people that, you know, um, we need to talk, we need to talk to people. And so I think, using your networks, but I love this. I love this idea of, of, um, of using your ERGs. It's definitely something I've done in the past is, is going through our ERGs and trying to get uh, users that way. Uh, and it's definitely something that I need to circle back on. Um, but, you know, with regards to recruiting blue collar workers, that's, that's really tough. And I, and I've, I've done everything to go through our customers and sometimes it's been successful and sometimes it has not. And so, um, it's really, you, you have to be real crafty about these things, real crafty and, um, and, and looking for people and, and, and using your networks, using your, your, and I, again, that goes back to what I was saying, the, the, the connections that, that you make your lived experiences and the connections that you maintain, right? I think that's why it's so important to, um, the connections that you have in your own personal life, who are the friendships uh, in your own personal life, are they from your own sort of socioeconomic status background, um, or 
are, are they diverse too, right? I think that's, that's really telling as well from a number of different perspectives as a researcher, as um, just someone who, you know, who, who, who really sees the importance of this work of diversity and inclusion, what does my social circle look like? Um, and, and where can I, where can I reach back um, to use that in getting more voices heard? That's a great point. Great. So I know we're uh, going over a little bit of time, but maybe if I could ask one more question that we have in here. Um, we have some we have some other ones. If you want to jot, jot down the, the answer for those afterwards in the Q&A, we can go ahead and do that. But Leigh asked a question earlier. Um, I am curious about other ways you go beyond extraction or rating. How do you invite people in fully as co-creators, perhaps from the process through uh, user implementation? And what tips do you have for educators who are working within short timeframes, et cetera? So is this the particular, in terms of extraction or rating, is that referencing what we talked about earlier is, you know, being really present mm -hmm. for people and not just, you know, going in and taking their information and running away with it. Um, how do you invite people in fully as co-creators is starting from the beginning. I think we talked about this as the, the recruiting aspect of it and being clear to all your stakeholders and yourself. And I, I love what Elena said about you know, you know, your, own, your own lived experiences and who you, you even imagine should have a seat at the table or be in the room. Um, you know, being, if you're the researcher or the service designer or the service design researcher and you're working with a group of stakeholders, being sure that people understand this broad array of people and then being able to craft a design um, method or research method that is participatory design or has requires a workshop or collaboration, um, those that's a, a ways of approaching it. And yes, it's difficult. Um, it's it's a little more time consuming. I think you know making those those trade offs with your stakeholders of this is what you'll get for this time and this is what you'll not get for this time. And really having those informed discussions about the trade-offs mm -hmm. between adding that extra time for that co-creative facilitated experience where you have those voices in the room with the stakeholders, with the designers, the product managers um, for a particular set of circumstances or uh, you know, an education opportunity. What is the, the payoff, the trade-off for that little bit of time? What, trade-offs and compromises are you willing to make? Those are my thoughts, Elena. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you have to make trade-offs, right? That's that's key for the for the time and um and for who you want to who you want to include, right? Or or who needs to be included. And so um you have to decide that up front. You, I think that's that's very, very important to decide up front and, and where your resources are going to go to and the time and and things like that. Great. Well, we have a couple more questions. Do you have do you have a couple more minutes to to? Okay. So I wanted to thank Mario as well for some of his questions. He had been popping in the chat earlier. I think I think we might have covered all those. But there's one more in here that I, I thought was very kind of maybe well quite pressing. <laughs> so uh, I, morale, I think is might might be how you say your name, uh, Tabrizi. When doing B2B research in tech companies, unfortunately, the pool of potentially available participants are saturated with white male or male Asian and Indian participants. It is extremely difficult to find participants outside of that group, particularly female, brown, and black participants. How do you justify the extra time and effort and budget needed to further diversify your participants groups, uh, which can potentially extend your research timeline by weeks to recruit a diverse group? That's a good question. You know, um, when I first started here at SAP, we didn't really have a budget for, and, and uh, Patrick's on, he's, he's, he's listening. We didn't have a budget. So I had to be super scrappy. Um, and I'm, you know what, I'm down for being scrappy. You know, I'm totally down for, for being scrappy and using my network. And that's basically what I did. I, I went and used my network on Facebook and on uh, LinkedIn. And, um, and just reached out to people, you know, I, I, I knew that some people were uh, customers of SAP or that worked at companies at SAP. And 
Um, I would reach out to people and I would reach out to people on Facebook. I'd say, hey, I'm looking for someone that does this thing. And, um, you know, will you spend 30 minutes with me? Uh, and, and specifically, you know, because I knew my network was diverse, right? So that, that's what I'm saying. If you are doing this work that requires you to be super scrappy, then you need to get your network together. Do you know? So um, <laughs> that that's that's what helped me. And talking to friends of friends, I'm like, hey, do you know anybody who 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 does X Y Z or works in this? Or I'd really love to talk to them. And sometimes that meant, you know, me saying, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna send them a, a gift card that might have come out of my my own pocket. I don't recommend anybody you don't necessarily have to do that, especially if you're working for a big company that can pay. Now, now I would probably say, hey, we're gonna, we need this and, and I'm gonna pay these people, right? But when I first started, you know, I didn't I, I didn't have the, those resources yet and I didn't have the know-how yet. So um, that's what I did and 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 I did. And, and that's what I, um, that's how I got to talk to blue collar workers. That's how I got to talk to more a more diverse set of people is um is being scrappy in that way and sometimes you still have to do that because like i said a lot of these places that recruit uh users they are mostly white collar white men or people who work in the tech industry if there's diversity it's people who are engineers and work in the and, and they're not the ideal user that we're looking for um and so um it's it, it's really i think using your using your networks and um and 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 I think, you know, you're, you're saying, what's the argument? What's the lo the logic? You know, how do we how do we get people to realize like, hey, we need we need more resources to be able to recruit um, people and to be able to to pay people. I mean, I think, you know, it goes back to what, what do we get? Um, what what do we get when we when we are able to hear diverse voices? Right. Um, we we depending on the product that you're using. Right. But but we get better insights. You know, when we have teams that are more diverse, we, we get better work outcomes, right? Because we are able to get these different perspectives that we otherwise wouldn't. And so I think it's really, you know, to me, communication is key. So how do you communicate, how do you communicate your, your, your argument, uh, first putting that together um, and then, and then, uh, and then going from there as well. So, and for businesses, and I know that, uh, and, um, you know, Jean-Baptiste in her book talks about this is, you know, at Google, they definitely did a study and said, is there a business benefit to adding more diverse internal, um, internal perspectives as well as customers? And, and yes, there was a business benefit. You broaden your market. You have the opportunity for markets that feel like they aren't being considered to potentially consider them and broaden your opportunities in your market. So opportunity, the business opportunities um, are there as well. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you both JD and Adelina, Dr. Adelina Longoria um, for your time uh, in this critical discourse. Uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and, and wrap up now. And thank you also for taking some extra time to go over and share your extensive knowledge and wisdom with us. It's been very valuable and very insightful. Um, and thank you for everyone on the call for joining today as well. So have a great weekend and take care, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Bye, thank you, Adelina. Great. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.